I want to welcome everybody to this afternoon's session. You're stuck with me alone because Peggy had another commitment, so um, we'll get started. We have um, 14 people re attending remotely. We want to welcome them as well as those of you who are here with us today. Um, in your packets is um, the agenda as well as a lot of the material we will be referring to, including the presentations, um, a circular that was put out, uh, or two circulars that were put out since the last time we met, as well as analyses of bills that were amended since the last time we met. Um, you'll notice that there are two analyses of the same bill, AB 1381. Uh, the reason for that is that it was amended twice since the last time we met. Um, if you have any questions during the meeting, um, please make sure you raise your hand so we can get the microphone over to you so the people who are listening from afar can hear the question. And we'll try to address every question that we can this meeting. If not, we'll get back in touch with you afterwards. Um, parking validation is for the CalPERS, CalSTRS members only. Um, the only other way to pay for it is with a credit card. For those of you who weren't here this morning, there was a couple of issues that we did jointly with CalPERS. <clears throat> one was a presentation on working after retirement, and the other one was um, determining where we're going to move, where we're going to have the EAC meeting next year. Um, it was decided to move it back to CalPERS for next year. And the, the dates, there was some question about the dates of the meeting, but we worked it out during the lunch. And the dates you see at the bottom of, of our agenda, which means February 12th, May 7th, August 6th, and November 13th are the dates that the EAC and the SEAC will be meeting at CalPERS. Our meeting will be in the morning. Their meeting will be in the afternoon. So just everything's been flipped over. Just the easiest way to deal with it. Um, so on the agenda today, um, we'll start with Marianne and Joyce to give an update on legislation in particular, um, a couple of the bills dealing with the implementation of PEPRA. Um, I'll talk for a little bit about the initiative that was introduced and then was amended yesterday, or was resubmitted yesterday with some changes made to it. Uh, then Bill will talk a little bit about the pension solution system that we're, that we're starting that project. And then Peter to give an update on the, on the regulations around credible comp. And then Phil will give an update on GASB. And then we have an opportunity for any open forum discussion. And then we can talk about any items you want on the February agenda. So before we get started, is there anything that you want to make sure, in addition to what's on the agenda, that we do cover? Yeah, hold on a second. Wait, got to wait for the traveling microphone. Actually, this question is from Melissa Anderson. She couldn't be here today. But at the last meeting, she had brought up um, trying to obtain a definitive answer from CalSTRS regarding um, compensation or creditable service. And at that time, we had asked, or the particular um, situation that she referenced, I'm reading her email, sure. sorry. <laughs> the particular situation um, she referenced involved a CalSTRS retiree providing specialized governance training and other consultation services for some of our districts. Um, we, at the county office, sent a copy of the blank contract to CalSTRS to make a determination prior to the retiree performing the service. Um, member account services responded to the services being performed and stated that they were not reportable by SIRS, but that they would need to see the fully executed agreement at the time that it was put in place. So we provided that um, to CalSTRS for the final determination, and the answer that we got was the service was not SIRS reportable, but the answer also included a disclaimer that a future CalSTRS audit may result in a different determination. So even after all that, the retiree still has no definite answer or assurance that the work they have um, been performing is or is not subject to the retiree earnings limitation. So Melissa is requesting that a pre-approval process be established so that CalSTRS retirees would know upfront whether their earnings would be subject to the earnings limit. Right. Yeah. And then she said that you would discuss that. Um, possibility and bring the topic back here, but it, she didn't see it on the agenda. Yeah, it's because we haven't had the chance. It's an issue that we have to work really closely with legal over, and we just haven't had the chance to resolve that. So I, I promise there's issues with not only around retiree, but also just around cre what's credible compensation for active members, and this has come up before. And you know, we just haven't had a chance to, to, to sort of provide the definitive answer in terms of, of whether or not we can have some free approval process. So we'll, we'll, I promise we will work on it. I will try to get it resolved so we can bring it back at the February meeting. OK, thank you for okay. that. Sure. Anything else? Seeing none, then Mary Ann and Joyce Lynn are to give an update on legislation.
This is Joyce Lynn. I'm Mary Ann. <laughs> We're oftentimes found together. Um, so welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Happy fall. Uh, my portion's going to be real brief. You've been updated all along as to the movement of legislation throughout the year. In your packets, there should be a goldenrod um, document that lists the bills that we were monitoring last year. Last year, it seems like it was a little bit light. Um, perhaps in terms of legislation, but that's because it was following up on all the activity in terms of PEPRA. So last year we sponsored four measures. The governor actually signed three of the four. Um, AB 125 is still over on the Senate side, and we hope to pursue that again this year. Uh, one that the governor did sign that we sponsored was AB 989, and that um, gives Kelsters the authority to make e electronic delivery of the RPR, or the Retirement Progress Report, the default, unless, of course, the member wants a printed copy, and then they can request and, and have a printed copy. Um, the other two bills, AB 1379, that was our annual technical housekeeping bill. You have the analysis in your packet, so I encourage you to read it. There were about 22 small little mini provisions or changes, so if you have any concerns or questions about those, um, please let me know. And then AB 1381 was another cleanup bill. Um, Joyce is going to talk about that in just a minute. That was uh, to conform... Calster's Law, or the TRL, to PEPRA. And then um, SB 13 is something that Joycelyn's going to talk about as well, and that was another cleanup bill for PEPRA. This year, we don't have any uh, recommended sponsored legislation um, besides our annual technical housekeeping bill at this point. That could change if um, ideas come in. At the November board meeting, the board did approve CalSTRS looking into ways to allow more employers to directly report to CalSTRS um, instead of through their governing county office of education. So um, that's in the works as to how we would go about doing that. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, Tristan. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go into more specifics regarding AB 1381, which, as Mary mentioned, is our PEPRA cleanup bill, and SB 13, which is a more general PEPRA cleanup bill, kind of basically coincides with ours, so I won't be mentioning specifically from that bill. Um, but what I want to start with, and I know it was a question that came up this morning, I know I got a phone call about it and left a message about it, but it, membership, basically, who's two at 62, who's two at 60? Um, in AB 340, in PEPRA, as it originally was passed, it mentioned reciprocity, and members with reciprocity should be able to be classic members, or as we would call them, two at 60 members. Um, unfortunately, CalSTRS does not have reciprocity, so the way they wrote the law didn't include us in that. So when we implemented, as of January 1st, 2013, we said if you first performed service that could be credible to CalSTRS, either in 2013 or after, you're two at 62. And before that time, you're two at 60, and there was nothing to do with reciprocity. So that's how it was implemented. We did find out from the legislature they meant to include us. They just didn't write it that way. So in AB 1381, we've inserted the fact that if you were a member of a concurrent retirement system, so that's what we have to work with is concurrent membership. If you were a member of a concurrent retirement system prior to 2013, then if you move to become a CalSTRS member, you can be two at 60. So that's CalPERS, Legislators, Reti Legislators Retirement System, the 37 at counties, San Francisco. I think I'm missing one. Um, but we'll be implementing that. So you may have some people that you did enter into your system in the last year that really did work for CalPERS or some other system prior in 2012 or prior to that. So we'll have to make a correction for them. And this does go back to January 1st, 2013. Um, the implementation team hasn't started yet, but we will work on a way for you to let us know. I know you are already talking to employer representatives when somebody maybe been mischaracterized according to the law. So that is a potential way to let us know that you know of someone who was a concurrent member. Um, there may be something else that the implementation team comes up with, like a form maybe you could give your new employees and they could certify that they were a member of a concurrent retirement system. But this is something we'll be implementing going forward. It is retroactive, but just unfortunately there was that glitch in PEPRA and it didn't really apply to CalSTRS. 
So that is how we'll be working on it. I know, again, that was a question that came up this morning, I believe via email. So is there any more clarification I can provide on that at this time? So I know that was a big one. It was like it always was meant to be, but didn't quite happen right. So we've got that fixed now. Um, other thing I want to mention is the contribution rate. Um, just that it was confirmed in AB 1381 that it is 50% of the normal cost. So that's 8% right now. It can change, and the law lays out how that would change in the future based on the normal cost. And um, also this last year, we were able to confirm and put in the law that this, these rates are not subject to collective bargaining. These were some kind of open questions based on the way Pepper was written, again, because our members are different from other retirement system members, and they were trying to do a one-size-fits-all. We've got that confirmed at the law now. Um, I do want to bring up uh, creditable compensation. There is a new definition of creditable compensation for two at 62 members. I mean, it was new with PEPRA, so you've heard about it since PEPRA went into effect, but it is now laid out in the teacher's retirement law. And one thing that I want to point to, though, that sounds different, um, under PEPRA it said that the pay, your pay, your creditable compensation, your pensionable compensation has to be paid your monthly rate of pay or base pay. Now, for CalSTRS members, you're, they're not necessarily working every month, you know, be it summer school or things like that, or um, 10, 10 pays you're all familiar with. Um, so monthly rate of pay doesn't really work for our members, and we don't have a definition of base pay. So how AB 1381 was written and signed into law is that it says that credible compensation is defined as being paid each pay period in which credible service is performed. I had received some questions about this, and it is a change, because I know there are some times that um, contracts will have amounts of money paid at the end of, of various months of service being performed. But again, the implementation team will be meeting and making sure to address all the questions of how exactly to pay it, but the law does read, um, paid each pay period service is performed. And that's the way it gets at the concept that PEPRA was already putting into place that just didn't, again, quite jive with our members. So I want to make sure that we got, I mentioned that so that you know that's coming. And both these, uh, the things I'm talking about right now too, because they're very tightly tied to PEPRA and making sure it's clear for our members, are retroactive to January 1st, 2013. So I will let you know there are some provisions that are going to be prospective starting in 2014, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> yes? This one thing to make clear that it's entirely possible that Existing pay practices would have to change in order for some compensation to be creditable. For example, lottery payments or things that are paid at the end of the year would not be credible for two of 62 members. So if, you know, so we're not saying that our implementation will necessarily reflect everything the way you want it to be or the way it is now, but you need to be aware that there may be a change. And part of that stems from, in PEPRA, it did say that, for example, one-time payments and ad hoc payments are not creditable for PEPRA members. So that's something, again, different from our 260 members. So that is in the law for them. Get where the right place in my notes. Um, so how many of you have employers who have cash balance benefit plans? OK, excellent. Um, for you, I wanted to let you know that they did decide that PEPRA does apply to cash balance participants where it can. So obviously, they don't have a. Um, an age factor when they retire, because it's not based on that type of formula. But where it can apply, it does. So they do have a definition of salary they, that reflects the definition of pensionable compensation in PEPRA. They do have a compensation cap. They do, where it is applicable, have a no, new normal retirement age of 62. And let's see if I missed anything. Also, the same membership requirements apply. So if they were a, concurrent, a member of a concurrent system, when they become a participant, they could be two at 60. So where it can apply, PEPRA does apply to cash balance members. So I wanted to put that out there too. That wasn't clear in the first, when the law first came out. Um, also, the, here's some portions of AB 1381. These, the ones I'm gonna talk about now are effective January 1st, 2014 and going forward. And the reason they are is because they apply basically only to two at 60 members um, or they deal with post-retirement <laughs> employment. And I know you heard some of these this morning, so it may be a little bit repetitive, but I think it might be good to hear it multiple times. And I had mentioned these the last time I believe I was here and spoke, but again, signed into law, so they are official now, but bargained one year final compensation and employer paid member contributions are going away for 2% at 60 members. 
It's clear under PEPRA that they would be unavailable for 2% at 60 members, but we've got gotten the feedback and put into the bill, and it's now law, that those two benefits, if, you, if the employer has been willing to pay for them, will go away for contracts that are new after January 1st, 2014. So any type of change or a new contract, um, the employer will not be able to provide um, member contributions or bargain when your final comp. So and actually, I think I'll pause for a minute because I've said a lot. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with 1381 clarification, you said that what would be credible compensation would be paid in a pay period where credible service is performed. Where service that is being paid for by that credible is, is performed. <laughs> okay. Does that take away the contractual language that CalSTRS allows for 10-month employees to be paid over 11 or 12 months? No, I, wouldn't, I, no. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I mean, it, we, would, we would have interpreted it that way, would we? No, I, you know, it's, the issue, the issue that we're trying to get at is, is if you perform service and didn't pay it till the end of the year, then you weren't getting paid. You did get paid for the year in the months in which credible service was formed, and then you, you then you got they got paid for other months as well. In your scenario, what what the so concern that was? A special compensation. Well, it relates it relates to a number. I mean, it may be things like, for example, like a lot of districts don't pay their lottery payments until the end of the year and see how much money they've got. That wouldn't that wouldn't work any longer with two percent of sixty two members. Or um, a possibility is, that, and that, like I said, the implementation team hasn't hasn't done all the work, but in theory, if you have a situation which coaches don't get paid until they fulfill the season, that, you know, and it's a six-month season, that might not work either. That might not, might not be credible. But in terms of going the other way in which they perform service for 10 months, but they get paid over 12 months, they still, you still abided by the requirement that they get paid in every month that service is performed because they were paid every month that service was performed. They just got paid in additional months beyond that. Anyone else right now? Of course, you could always welcome to ask questions at the end, too. Um, some of the other provisions, these are the post-retirement employment provisions that will take effect January 1st, 2014. One thing that Ed had mentioned this morning during the presentation is that now payments to tax shelter annuities and tax-deferred retirement plans, such as 403Bs, 401Ks, those will count towards the earnings limit. and. We are also going to be looking at the annualized rate of pay for a member. It sounded familiar to something similar to what CalPERS was talking about this morning, but the annualized rate of pay is what the individual, the retired individual should be paid. And in addition, this is for the CB employers, the 180-day separation from service requirement is being extended to CB annuitants. That's not very many of them because most of them take a lump sum. Um, but if you have a CB annuitant that's hired as a retiree, um, they also do need to sit out for 180 days or else face having their, their benefit reduced dollar for dollar. And another piece on the cash balance side, and this is a little outside of the norm, but and I'm not sure if any of you that have CB um, programs in your districts, but if any of you um, bargain the contribution rate, or if you just go for four and four, I think there's only four districts out there that bargain the contribution rate and the employer's paying more. But in the spirit of PEPRA, where they want a more 50-50 payment scheme for contributions, we are starting with new contracts after January 1st, 2014. The employer and the member either have to pay equal amounts or the employee Nice. The employer and the member can pay equal amounts, or the members can pay more of a contribution rate, but the employers cannot pay a greater contribution rate. So that is a change as well, which doesn't apply to very many employers, but I want to put it out there. And then I just want to, this is more of a public service announcement, <laughs> so it hasn't changed with these new laws. But in PEPRA, there was the felony forfeiture section. And so that if anybody commits a felony, we have to take away their retirement benefit for a period of for the period of they committed the felony to whenever they've been working it until um, we are tracking people that you, that are have been convicted of felonies, and we're working on getting information about them because we need to know all the information to be able to fix their benefit. Fix is probably the wrong word, but change their benefit in the way that the um, law describes. Um, the way the law requires information to flow is that the member 
and the prosecuting agency are supposed to inform, inform the employer. And then the employer and the member are supposed to inform CalSTRS of a felony conviction. Um, we have tried to get information from the prosecuting agencies and have had a lot of trouble. And when we've contacted employers to try to get more information, they, they're not necessarily knowing about the felony conviction or that may have been the first time they've heard about it. They're not getting information from the prosecuting agency. So we just want to put it out there that you know, if we hear of a felony conviction, we do have to come looking for information because the law requires that we change their benefit. And so I don't know if, and again, with so many different employers, you all have different ways of handling that information. But just to keep in mind that that will be coming your way from prosecuting agencies and that we'll be looking for it as well. So we just want to put it out there that, yes. Oh, microphone. <laughs> Debbie Ledford, Nevada County. And that's if they... Um, commit a felony in the scope of their job, right? It's not outside of that. Right. Okay. You are correct. Thank you for that clarification. And any questions on that? Anybody had any experiences they might want to share? I don't know. I mean, it's, not, it's maybe not necessarily time to share everything, but anything that's worked for people. It probably hasn't happened very much yet, but just to put it out there. Um, and then I did want to let you know it's kind of in the same vein. We just heard about this yesterday, but there has been an initiative that's gone to the Attorney General's office for title and summary. And it has to, it's, and the reason I mention it too in this, at this moment is it has similar rings of the felony forfeiture piece of PEPRA, but it has to do with egregious activities and dismissal of employees. And it sets up a dismissal process that employers would have to use if they commit any of these egregious activities that are defined in the in the initiative and the proposed initiative and then if they so and then if they deliver a notice to this person that they're going to go through this dismissal process at a certain point they don't earn any more retirement and they um, the employer can recover payments made to or on behalf of the employee it's very vague we don't know if that we really understand it yet. We're looking at the language, but I just want to put it out there because I think it would have a lot of, it would have a greater impact on employers than it does actually on CalSTRS because it has this dismissal process in it. But I wanted to throw that out there. So it was, the letter went to the Attorney General's office on October 29th. So it should be out there on their website. Anyways, that's sort of a side note. <laughs> and any questions from email? Yes, I have a question from um, Monica, and she wants to know if there will be a directive or additional information on the Cal Stirs Employer uh, Workshop book with the listing of credible service and special compensation for 2% at 62 retirement formula. I'm looking toward the business areas. If we... Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll be working on additional information to send out. I don't know exactly what format it would take, but employer directive, something on so, um, you know, later um, Peter will be talking about credible compensation from the 2% at 60 side of things with the regulations. So there'll be more information going out. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else from email? No? Anything? Oh, Bina has a question. There's the microphone. Regarding the employer rate, I quite didn't understand when you say the change only applied to few agencies or something like that. Oh, on for cash balance, for if you're in a cash balance benefit okay. program, if you offer that, then in the past you've been able, the employer and the members or participants have been able to negotiate the rates if they wanted to, and oftentimes that resulted in the employer paying a greater contribution rate than the members or the participants. So that won't be allowed going forward with the new contracts in January 1st, 2014. But if you are not cash balanced, like the regular, is everything is the same? Eight it's 8.25% 8. 8. Okay. as it is in statute. And no upcoming change for that? Not that we are aware of. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Well, there's, there's no change under existing law, but obviously depending on how our funding situation with DB gets addressed, that could easily change the contribution rate, but nothing okay. as a result of these bills. Okay, thank you. So that's just on the CB side. Good question. Anything else? Any, anything at all on PEPRA? <laughs> OK. Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>
So next is, um, speaking of initiatives, um, on the agenda, I was going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the initiative that's been submitted to the Attorney General uh, called the Pension Reform Act of 2014. And they resubmitted the initiative yesterday to make some changes. So what I'll be speaking to is, is the initiative as it's been submitted as of yesterday. So it'll be somewhat different than what you may have heard about the initiative um, up until now. But, but basically the idea of the initiative is, is, is to amend the, Constitu the California Constitution to allow um, the future accrual of pension and retiree health care benefits of existing employees to be, to be reduced or perhaps even eliminated. So it specifically says that it doesn't affect the benefits that have accrued to date or as of or that have accrued up to a point where, the, where the, the employer takes some action, but that essentially that it would set up a process where the where a, a new benefit formula could be applied not only to future employees, but also to existing employees of, of that employer. So that's sort of the general framework of it, but let me sort of talk about some specifics, and I'll talk about it in the context of CalSTRS, because the way it was written for CalSTRS is different than it was written for anybody else. For all the other pension systems and for all the other employers, the, the central body that's making these determinations is the governing body of, of the employer. So it's the city council, it's the county board, in your case it would have been the school board, but in the case of CalSTRS members, as it applies to the pension benefits, what it says is that the, for purposes of this act, the legislature is the employer, not the, not the school board. So the school board doesn't have any responsibility under the act as it applies to CalSTRS retirement benefits. That's not the case for CalPERS retirement benefits, though. So presumably the provisions that apply in the act as it relates to your CalPERS employees would be on the on the the responsibility or the authority of, of the school board to handle that. So essentially what it says is that if, if there's a determination made, well, well, first of all, what it says is that for existing members, existing public employees and for future public employees is that the only benefits that are vested are the benefits that are earned as they work. Under the existing case law in California, that once a person accepts employment in the public sector, they are vested for the benefits that are in place at the point that they, that they take the employment or if it gets improved down the road at that future date. So if, for example, that's why in PEPRA, in our particular situation, that people who were, who were CalSTRS members before this year were going to be 2% of 60, even though for future members we had a lower age factor for any given age. They couldn't adjust the future accrual of benefits for existing members. This would attempt to change. This would this would change that. This would say that for anybody going forward, that they're only vested for the benefits that are in place at the time they perform that service, and and therefore any future service could be under a different formula. So that's that's the first significant change, and it specifically amends the California Constitution in an effort to to make it clear that it's not an impairment of contract. So that's how they're that's how they're trying to address that that case law, although. Part of the, one of the issues is that the case law also speaks to the U.S. Constitution, which has a similar provision, so it's not clear how the initiative is going gonna, is gonna to get around that, but that's what they're trying to do. So, if, so then if, if the, in our case, if the legislature were to decide that um, the pension system is at risk of not having enough funds to pay benefits or, um, or that there's a fiscal emergency, such that the existing benefits would impair their ability to deliver services, then the legislature would have the authority to um, take a variety of actions, such as reducing the age factor in the future, uh, reducing cost of living adjustments for, for retirees, increasing the retirement age for payment of benefits, requiring employees to pay a higher contribution rate, or making other adjustments that are agreed upon during collective bargaining. Now, to the extent that any of these provisions are subject to collective bargaining, they would have to be bargained. But in our case, none of these are, are collectively bargained. So presumably the legislature would just pass a bill and, and make this happen. And then the, and then the other change is, this, is if there's a determination made in, in evaluation that the pension plan is less than 80% funded um, based on, on a general accepted accounting principles, 
then in our case, the legislature would have to adopt a stabilization, would have to prepare a stabilization report that would identify what it would take to get fully funded within 15 years, what the increase in the contribution rates would be, what changes in the, in the benefits would have to be, any of those things that would be necessary in order to be fully funded for 15 years. They'd have to conduct a hearing on it. They'd have to accept the report. But the, law, but the, but the initiative specifically says that there's no requirement they actually implement the report. So I guess they'll have a nice, there'll be a nice document that they can sort of see what the plan could be, but there's no requirement that they actually implement the plan. And then they'd have to submit a similar report every year until the pension plan were fully funded. So basically, that's sort of the structure. I mean, in, in, in every case, what it's doing is providing tools that are available to the governing body, to the employer, or in our case, to the, to the legislature, that if they, if they felt that they wanted to make changes to the pension system, they could not only apply those changes to future members, but also to existing members for their future service. So in terms of where things are now, they just submitted this yesterday. As they go through title and summary with the Attorney General, there'll be an analysis, a fiscal analysis done by the legislative analyst about what the costs of the measure would be. That gets incorporated in the title and summary. Once that's done by the Attorney General, and it's usually done, it's supposed to be done within 45 days, then, then the uh, proponents can go out and, and try to collect signatures. Because it's a constitutional amendment, it would have to collect 800,000 valid signatures. If they want to put this on the November 2014 ballot, they'd have to get all those signatures to the counties sometime more likely by the end of April. And so the longer this takes, the, the more difficult it is in the collect signatures. If they decide they want to have it for the 2016 ballot, they obviously have a lot more time. So, um, you know, so there's a, there's a number of, of steps that need to take place before this actually gets on the ballot and, and determining which ballot it is. So it's just out there. I just want to make sure people are aware of it. And um, we have not done, you know, we're working on a legal analysis to sort of identify the legal issues around it and what other implications it has. But I wanted to give you an opportunity, in case you had any questions about it, to ask those, and I'll answer them as best I can. So any questions about any of that? It's, it is available on the Attorney General's website if you want to actually see what the language is. But that in a nutshell, is what it is. No questions. Okay.